Hello, and welcome back to The Independent Pianist. I'm your host, Cole, as usual. I'm very excited today to be getting back into the Chopin etudes again. I uploaded a video about Opus 10 number 1 a long time back, and then kind of stopped doing them because that one was such a bother to record. It took me, I think, like 20 takes to get a good version of it. But anyway, nowadays I'm feeling much more ambitious about playing the Chopin etudes, and I love all of these these etudes as pieces anyway. So I definitely want to talk about most of them on this channel. So I'm going to try to go through them over the next few months along with my other projects. The so-called Aeolian Harp Etude has been one of my absolute favorites ever since I first heard it as a kid. I was absolutely enchanted by it and I knew I had to play it. It was the first Chopin Etude that I ever played or performed. It's usually considered to be one of the easier Chopin Etudes and maybe it is compared to the really hard ones, but beneath the surface, this piece has formidable technical musical difficulties to be conquered, and you don't often hear it played to its full potential, at least not to my mind. The main technical challenge that Chopin is going for here is the so-called uh, suplesse, or suppleness, of the wrist. Uh, Chopin talked about this kind of suppleness of wrist with his students very often, and it's also really the point of Opus 10 number 1 as well. In fact, any time you are playing an arpeggio in which you have to cover more than an octave from your thumb to your fifth finger, suppleness of the wrist becomes absolutely vital. And it's really this which allows people with hands that can't stretch more than an octave to play pieces like this one and Opus 10 number 1 flawlessly and with complete relaxation. In fact, I've even noticed sometimes that people with smaller hands actually play these pieces better than people with large hands because they can't try to overstretch at all. They just have to use their wrist. So the wrist is an amazing tool. If used well, it can compensate marvelously well for the limitations of a small stretch in the hand. So when I talk about suppleness of the wrist, I'm talking specifically about this kind of side-to-side -side motion, almost waving motion that the hand can make. So it's this kind of suppleness when combined with a very flexible arm motion and a very slight rotation of the hand that can allow you to easily cover distances that otherwise you would have to jump, you know, you'd have to move the whole hand just over from left to right kind of stiffly. This piece is a fabulous place to learn this technique, and much better actually than Opus 10 number 1, because it equally targets both hands in a very harmonious way. You know, the left and right hand are actually working in contrary motion, which I think I've mentioned elsewhere on this channel is the most natural kind of motion, because that way the motions of the hands are actually mirroring each other. To successfully play it, you develop this kind of very loose billowing motion in the arms and hands, which you can use to your advantage in many pieces in the repertoire, including things that are nominally much harder than this piece. So it kind of looks like, like this, kind of like a side-to-side -side motion with the, the hand turning out back and forth and the arm carrying it along. Beyond that, the musical difficulty lies in balancing the very lovely soprano melody against this welter of notes in the accompaniment. And here, uh, Schumann's famous comments about Chopin's playing of this etude are very relevant. Of course, he was the one who came up with this whole title of the Aeolian Harp. He compared Chopin's playing to an Aeolian Harp. But actually, his most important comment is not quite so poetic, but usually goes ignored. He says, and I quote, It would be a mistake to think that he brought out every one of the little notes distinctly. It was more like a billowing of the A-flat major chord, swelling from time to time by means of the pedal. But in the midst of the harmony were heard sustained notes of a wondrous tenor voice which came into greater prominence to join the principal cantilena. So, next time you hear a clattery performance of this piece in which you can pick out every single one of the small notes, think of Schumann's words. Uh, what he said is actually only reflected by Chopin's notation, which is a little bit peculiar. Chopin uses smaller note heads for most of the sextuplets, and only the principal melodic lines are marked with larger note heads. So he's really showing us visually very clearly what we need to hear in the music. And this brings me to a somewhat controversial point in this etude. As Schumann mentioned, there are several places where a tenor voice joins the soprano, and which Chopin marks very carefully. However, there are also other places where the perceptive practicer uh, might be able to clearly hear moving lines inside the texture, even though Chopin has not actually marked them with larger note heads. Sometimes it's so obvious that uh, it's hard to resist bringing them out. So here's two places where that does happen, and where I have actually chosen to bring these notes out in my playing.
question remains, should we actually bring these notes out or not? And you'll hear many performers who don't try to bring these uh, latent lines out. Uh, of course, I choose to do so without drawing too much attention away from the main voice, especially since uh, in the second place that I just quoted, the main voice is actually pretty much in stasis while the inner parts are actually providing motion and interest. So I think it's kind of asking for that in, in, in that situation. And this is actually one case where in one of the manuscripts, Chopin did write some of these uh, inner voices with larger note heads. So he may have already had that kind of as an idea, but maybe he didn't want it to overpower the main line too much either. So it would be easy to argue that what I'm doing is excessive, and there really isn't an argument against it. It's just a matter of personal taste. There are a number of other technical questions you might have if you study this piece. One is the possible redistribution of some of the inner parts. So in places like these, the left hand and right hand actually cross over each other. The two thumbs intertwine. And one solution is to redistribute the notes so that the hands don't cross. And there's no denying this is a little bit more convenient physically. You don't have to cover quite as wide a distance. I have to say for myself, I much prefer to keep the hand crossings. Hand crossings were a point of continual interest for romantic pianist composers. Schumann constantly writes chords in which the left hand and right hand thumbs intertwine. Uh, Liszt does things like this all the time as well. Not only does it give a slight difference to the sound, but there's also a kind of choreographic beauty to it as well. In the case of this etude, it seems a pity to redistribute for simplicity like that, since the whole point of learning this wrist suppleness is to be able to reach absurdly widely spaced harmonies with ease, so, you know, why not use it? It does also change the sound very slightly. It introduces a greater variety of accentuation, since in Chopin's original, the left hand and right hand thumbs alternately intertwine and then come apart again. So it actually creates variety of sound. Just a quick note on the form of this piece, it's a, it's a very common one actually for character pieces of the Romantic period, especially for ones like etudes that have continuous figuration. It's basically a free rendering of the old rounded binary form, in which there's a first half which goes from the tonic key to another key. In this case, it's a third up from the tonic. And then there's a second half which moves back from this other key back to the tonic key. So you can also think of it as being somewhat akin to a sonata form. A sonata form usually starts in one key, has a first half that moves to a different key, then there's a development section which varies the motives from the first half and moves back to the home key. In this case, there's only one main theme and a development, and then a very shortened return to the main theme at the end. So please enjoy the complete performance coming up of this beautiful etude. Uh, please also consider supporting this channel financially if you're able to do so. Every little bit helps uh, with letting me bring you this content. It does take many, many hours to prepare these videos every week, so everything that you can uh, uh, donate is is very much appreciated. And thank you very much for all my current supporters on Patreon, uh, PayPal, and, and other methods. I couldn't do it without you. So if you do want to become a financial supporter, uh, Patreon is a very easy way to make recurring donations. It's www.patreon.com forward slash independent pianist. And then I also have links in the description box for PayPal and other methods that you can use as well. So thank you very much for that. And until next time, please keep practicing and take care.